playing a concert of my own compositions. So for about three days in a row, I practiced basically as many hours a day as, as possible. That was the first time I began to notice um, pains. The pain after it developed in both arms got so bad that it interfered with virtually every aspect of life. Brushing my teeth became an ordeal. Brushing my hair was awful. It's very lucky that I did run into trouble and get pain because if I had not got pain, I almost undoubtedly would not um, have been led to Mrs. Tubman. There's a lack of awareness of discomfort. It is assumed that it has to be uncomfortable. And still today in the main conservatory, you hear students say, oh, I practice a lot today. My hands really ache without realizing that pain is a sign that they're playing badly, that they're hurting themselves. And this is what kept me teaching all these years, because as time went on, I saw more and more wonderful young prodigies being cut down much too early. Well, the first thing that went were the shoulders and the muscles in here. So they, they went to the point where um, I had muscle spasms all across the shoulders and upper back and into my neck. And at some point, I started to hurt from the tip of my fifth finger in the right hand all the way up to my shoulder. You know, I had been for x-rays, and I had been to doctors who gave me Valium, and I, people who told me I had scoliosis, and this, that, and the other thing. Not only could I not play, I could lift nothing, not even a paperback book, nothing. So I used to do things like play the ocean etude of Chopin three times in a row. And when I was finished, the muscles on my arms would be like, you know, just throbbing, you know. I did that to gain endurance, so I could play it once, you know. Part of the training of pianists, for example, is endurance. The word is repulsive, it's abhorrent. of playing at the keyboard should be euphoric. You should not be aware of your tooth. How can you interpret if you're enduring something at the same time? Your, your playing can only be as beautiful as the tools allow them to be. Spasmy, right? Suppose you had to do just five fingers. Would it pull up? You see. Not too bad there, is it? No. no. Now suppose you do a scale. Does it pull up? Yes, it does. When do you when does your fifth finger pull up when you play which finger on the scale? Would you find that for me? Do it fast and see what happens. It went, what, long before you got there. Third. On your third finger, right? Right. And that's because you're anticipating getting your thumb under. And in doing that, there's a pull. Now, what we're going to do... Whenever I take on new students, there are new problems. The variables are so enormous in the variety of coordinations that uh, no two problems are identical. You see, and yet, basic principles are identical. So that we have something, a guidepost from which to work. We find a great problem of pianists is the amount of twisting that goes on in the hand. In this, this way, like Charlie Chaplin's feet. You see, yeah. you see, there was much improved already. Much improved. Now, where were you just now? Now let's take that again. Uh, now here. Yeah. Why take the fourth finger so you can make sure you twist? <laughs> the fourth finger on a black key to go to a thumb, if you have an, an octave distance, is atrocious. The small amount of twisting that that fourth finger creates, I would guess that half the pianists who are injured and crippled do so because they're using the fourth finger on the black key. I find that's one of the most common causes of injury. So take your five there, okay? There, girl. There. Now the hand is straight. Isn't that beautiful? All right, now you'll get rid of a lot of that pain. You're not very comfortable here, are you? No. All right, let me see you do that. Well, you're doing a certain amount of twisting. 
interesting. Are you aware of this? Yeah, well, I, I'm aware of Let me see you do well. that slowly. Yeah. Now, when you go here, it's when you get to, the, to this chord, your fifth finger has to be way inside. I want you to see what your hand looks like. Play the chord. This is correct. It doesn't have to be any further than that, but it can't be. The minute you're going to do this, that little bit makes it impossible to get to the next chord. Now play it. Now the next one. Now that's finished. Now you're going to start the next group. Now start again. Da da da. Right. If you just keep that that there. Now you'll have da 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 bum. In other words, this passage has to go faster and faster. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be da 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 da. Right. Now the place to go faster is where you don't have to jump from the black key to the white key. Mm -hmm. When you come here, da da da. It becomes very easy. Come, get this, get these two. Da da da. Now, ya da da da. There you see. When the hand is twisted to a side, you've already broken the hand off from the arm. And one of the most important um, elements of a fine technique is the fact that the finger of the hand and the arm must work together as a unit. When you break it off sideways, you've destroyed that organization. You have the hand already working unilaterally, and the arm becomes tense and rigid behind it. How can a technique move with facility that way? Look at that. Look at that. You do this throughout the piece. Yes. Now, there's only one way that that can be avoided, and that is to realize that you never change the shape, which means that if you're going to play your thumb here, then your fifth finger is here, and you're perfectly straight. My problem is yes. my big... Yes. You feel that your fingers are too fat yes. to go inside. Great. I'm very glad you gave me that problem. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what is so magical is that if you are trained with rotation and in and out movements, the black keys will disappear. It angles the finger in another way. Just follow me. Go this way and just go forward. Does it bother you now? It's down here. You still feel it? Now, let's keep doing it. Don't drop your wrist, honey. If you drop your wrist, it won't work. Move forward, move forward. Still going down? No. Didn't go, did it go down now? It's still there. You still feel it. All right, see, now, now let me show you. If you rotate, if you can do it at the same time and rotate forward, it'll turn your finger slightly. Yeah, but not this much. Let me see you do this. Go ahead. There. Didn't, it didn't bother you, did it? No. Didn't feel it at all then. He made the, exactly the right movement. He moved in the exact amount. What's the question? What are you actually doing? Because I have a student with the exact same problem. He's just going in as he's twisting? Or? Just going in. Just just going in. He didn't twist, he didn't do anything, he just moved in now the exact right spot. You find the right spot, you're not going to feel the keys. Now, but you see how much easier... Although a lot of the ideas involved in what she teaches are simple and easy to comprehend, doing them correctly is a very subtle process. My name is Robert Shannon. I'm an associate professor of piano at Oberlin Conservatory. I happened to meet Dorothy uh, as a result of an injury I sustained to my right hand. Um, at, uh, let's see, in the fall of 1980, I had, for the first time in my career, really a whole lot of concerts to play, and including something I very much wanted to do, which was a tour of Venezuela. But uh, it was a strange circumstance. I had the tour on the condition that I learned the Elliott Carter Piano Sonata and I had 10 days to learn it. <laughs> and I practiced like a madman, you know, just day, night, day, night. And at some point, I started to have pain from the tip of my finger all along the side of my hand, way up to my shoulder. And like a true idiot, I said to myself, oh boy, I'm getting somewhere. And I practiced harder, and of course, strangely enough, the pain got worse and worse and worse, until finally, two days later, I had to admit that something was very seriously wrong. And, uh, it got to the point where I couldn't put my hand on the piano without experiencing this pain. So I had to cancel all my concerts. I tried my local doctor who didn't know what was going on. I went to the local athletic trainer who tried ultrasound and this ointment and that ointment. And that was all very pleasant, but it didn't help. And eventually I went to the Mayo Clinic and they gave me all kinds of tests and said, boy, you've got a great hand, you know, really flexible, really moves great. You know. What kind of maniac are you? You know, you're, you're not supposed to practice that much. Rest for six months and you'll be fine. So I took their advice. I didn't play the piano at all for six months. 
And then I started to practice again. And after 15 minutes, I would start to experience the same pain exactly the same way. And every day was like that. This went on for the better part of two years. I was able to play a few concerts, just kind of not practicing all that much and getting around it. But it kept coming back, and it was very, very debilitating. It was like I really felt like I had done something permanent to myself that was never going to heal, and that my ability to perform and practice and uh, even teach well, I felt, was going to be seriously impaired for the rest of my career. Um, if your whole life is centered around trying to play your instrument, if all of a sudden you can't do it, um, that's a big trauma, you know, very big trauma. I heard about Dorothy through a friend of mine and went down to Brooklyn. And I guess when you, when you uh, talk to people who worked with her, you get all these wonderful first encounter stories. And mine was certainly something like that. Um, I went in there not expecting too much. And uh, she sat me down at the piano and said, well, what's wrong with you? And so I told her and she said, uh, well, play something for me. So I sat down and I played two chords. I can tell you exactly which chords, but it was like plunk, plunk. And she said, oh, stop. Don't touch the piano anymore. It's all wrong. But thank God it's trivial. I'll cure you in 10 minutes. And uh, I said to myself, well, sure, she's going to cure me in 10 minutes. And nine minutes later, nine minutes later, I was dropping from about this high on my fifth finger, making a huge sound with no pain at all. The next day, I practiced six, seven hours, had no pain. And I've never had any trouble since. <laughs> About your fingers, what did you see? They started curling. The one yeah. finger was curling. It is the yes. What we'll do today is work on the scale. She's so see if we can get that uh, conscious of what every person needs okay. How you doing? and very you reluctant to confuse yeah. them with too much stop. information. Stop. If there's anything that's working naturally, she's stop. not going to mess with it. And okay, I think it's Dorothy's particular stop. genius that she's able to deal with every stop. person that comes into her studio in a different way and say, look, there are you know, God knows how many elements that go into playing in a coordinated fashion, and you have 15 and a half of them, and I'm going to give you number 17, 18, and 19. And if you don't understand the first way I tell you to do it, I'll tell you another way, and you'll get it. Hold your hand like this for me, okay? Like this. Now, put it in front of you. Like this. I want you to make, give me this movement. That's what's missing in your technique. No, no, you're wobbling. In one piece, like a tennis racket. That's right, just turn it. That's the movement. Feel it in here. Okay? Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is this. Right, now, at this point, play the thumb from the arm. Now, I want you to rotate in this way up. Now, when you come down, don't pull up your fingers at all. Your arm lifts your fingers. No, you're lifting your fingers from your fingers. I want you to do it this way. The arm is going to lift your fingers. I don't want you to feel it pulling the fingers. No, not this way. Sideways. Let's do it again. For really a unified motion to take place, the fingers and the arm move at the same speed and in the same direction together. Motion is made in a direction, and that's really the whole story of technique. That when we move, to the, when we move up and to the left, everything moves together. You see, all the fingers are lifted together. When we swing back, everything comes, goes down together. Nothing stays up. If you go down and other fingers are pulling up like that, that's not going to work. And people do that, people who were trained with isolating the fingers, sometimes they go down and other fingers are pulling up. And you have While to I was getting my master's, I heard about down, Dorothy Taubman. I heard about the scientific approach, which instantly turned me off. And I was not interested at all. My roommate went to observe a lesson. Mrs. Taubman had invited her. And she always admired the fact that I could play so well. And she did not play. She, she was limited. Today, I know that her hands were better than mine because she had very solid hand. It was just a small hand, and it was limited. I really had problems. I didn't realize at the time. And she was developing beautiful. And suddenly, I could hear things she was doing. She was playing Liszt and very difficult pieces that, uh, and with ease. She told me I could trill for 10 minutes. I'll never forget without ever getting tired. And that was very, very strange, you know. And the, the way to think of the trill also is it's helpful to think if you want to teach children, for example, that you really, it's the same as standing on both legs and shifting from one to the other. It's a shift. And I said that a very good example of the single rotation would be a trill. 
because that's a single rotation. It's left, right, left, right. And the playing in one direction already, again, and going a little bit beyond gives you already the, the motion to go next to the next note. The important thing with that is it has to be perfectly synchronized as you go faster and faster. The motion becomes smaller and smaller and you don't see anything. It evolved. I, I, I did it well and she started feeling comfortable with me. And she knew that I loved the work and I understood it very well. I started having very good results with students. Now, of course, how would we have the school if Edna hadn't taken over the lecturing? I dumped it in Edna's lap and I called her on the phone and I said, Edna, would you want to do the lecturing because I can't do it? She said, me? You know? <laughs> no, me? I no. no, she said no. No, she said no. This is not something that is just a strange, weird, mysterious work. This is knowledge. And musicians are simply not used to the idea that there might be knowledge around to help them with their problems. It's a very strange idea, the same way that it was to me. Okay. Now what you're going to do is turn it this way. That's it. And when you come down on your second finger, bring your thumb close to your second finger. And, and the other fingers are going to be touching the keys. And you're going to take your third finger and do the same thing. Good. Where's your fifth finger? Not right. You're not touching the keys. I can't. Oh, yes, you can. Play your third. Now, you're not going to lift from here. There'll be no lifting sensation whatsoever. Your arm is turning. You're doing nothing. And just throw it. Okay. Remember what you said to me before when I said, can you get your finger down? You said, I can't. Can you? Yes. All right. You know, the piano should become something loving to you. You should feel that I want to touch it all the time. That's very important. You work with her, Edna, every day just to get her to do this. By the time she leaves here, that will be solved. To about here with a second and to about here with a third, okay? Yeah. About here with a second. Perhaps the other aspect of it that right. made it so valid to me was the fact that I had wanted to do something where I did something for other people. And I felt that playing it's good, it's right. did not justify it's playing it's alone. Good. Now, the, I wanted to say something about exercises in general. And it was James who said on instrumental study, and I quote, but singling out basic forms is not solving the technical problems connected with them. Not one of the etude writers says a word about the dear deadly question of how the thing is done. End of quote. getting my doctorate in Juilliard. I saw her for the first time because I was accompanying a roommate who wanted to study with her, and I just came along for the ride. And after I saw her solve a problem for her that she had I'd heard her struggle with for months and months without being able to solve, uh, on a lark, I went over to the piano and I asked her, would you help me with something? And she said, certainly. And I showed her, uh, as the uh, Chopin etude, Opus 10 number one, which involves a lot of arpeggiated patterns uh, and the use of a fourth finger, which always got stuck and I could not articulate. And I would say within 30 seconds, she had me playing the piece effortlessly and I was just sitting there dumbfounded because I just couldn't believe that that was possible. I, I used to struggle and struggle with stretching and pulling and couldn't get it. And here was, a simple approach of, not, of moving to the fourth finger, which made it feel as strong as all the other fingers. And in all the years that I had been playing the piano, that was a totally new sensation for me. There is no limitation in the flexion ability of the fourth finger, only in the lifting. But the piano is not up, the piano is down below. Thank God. Among the many teachers I've had, there was one who suggested I do this incredible exercise, strangely enough, an exercise by Brahms, where you hold down two notes silently, and then you have to do these incredible contortions 
where you, it's, I remember specifically, it's number 19 from Brahms 51 Exercise, where you do this sort of thing, you know, and it's, it's a to total um, isolation of these motions. And the idea behind the exercise, I guess, is to put your arms through as great a pain as possible. Um, I went through one exercise phase where I, I did every etude or book of exercise I could get my hands on, such as Dohnani and Pishna and Charni, you name it. And, I, and um, I thought that at the end of the day when my arms were exhausted, wow, I must really be getting somewhere. When you're being told that pulling and stretching your fingers, you've got to stretch your hand. When tests have been made, Ortman's book show that they made tests for years where the fourth finger was pulled and stretched and it didn't change one bit and they're still pulling and stretching the fourth finger. And there's nothing wrong with the fourth finger. They're being told that because there's a ligament that crosses from the fifth to the third finger, and the fourth finger cannot lift as high as the other fingers, and therefore that's an impediment. So they're pulling. You know, Schumann put a string from the ceiling to the finger and pulled it and crippled it. Well, they're still doing it without strings. What they haven't realized is that we never play the piano that way. Instead of lifting a finger away, we can lift all the fingers away and drop each finger individually. There's no tissue on the bottom that prevents you from dropping with power away from the rest of the hand. So that if you turn the technique around, there's no problem with the fourth finger. I had just graduated from Harvard in uh, June of 84. And I had auditioned for Juilliard and some, by some miracle gotten in, even though I basically had not been able to practice. The only way I could barely squeak, I could barely play at all was um, after I played, my arms would be in ex both arms incidentally began to hurt. I would put ice in them and rub the ice on for like 10 minutes. And I went to many doctors and I got many diagnoses. Um, some said I had um, tendonitis of, at the insertion of the lateral epicondyle. Um, so they said, if you have tendonitis, um, we may have to try a cortisone injection or if that doesn't work, you may actually have to have surgery. Before I met Mrs. Taubman, I tried almost everything the medical world offered. Um, including ultrasound, um, lots of drugs, baclofen, naproxen. I tried acupuncture even. I had traction, I had massage, I had um, hot and cold treatments. Um, I went to a clinic for sports medicine. The first thing they did, they sat me down in this tub of cold water, which was 34 degrees, and they made me put both arms in the cold water for five minutes, and that was absolutely the most painful experience I've ever had in my life. Then I walk out with these icicles for arms, and they sit me down at a table and this woman starts, takes her thumbs and she starts digging me into my elbow. I'm just going like this. I go, Jesus. It was very, very a painful year. Uh, basically the year 1984. Um, I met Mrs. Taubman in, or I auditioned for Mrs. Taubman in early June of 84, and she said she would accept me the following year. I went into her studio, and she says, put your hand, she says, okay, you know, put your hand on the keyboard. So I put the hand on my keyboard, and instantly my fingers clenched up into the old method, which is what I was taught. She says, there's no reason to clench your fingers like that. Just simply drop your arm and then just set your hand on the keyboard in the normal, the normal hand position that, that your hand would fall naturally if it were by your side. I said, hmm, that makes sense. Why didn't anyone tell me that? Um, then um, then we, we began just the five finger exercise where we do the initial um, rotation on the thumb. Um, then what happened? Uh, and then after that she taught me the scale about how um, the so-called thumb under is totally incorrect. You shouldn't put your thumb under because the minute you put your thumb under, you're tying up all these tendons on the top of the hand. Um, and then, then we took up a Mozart concerto. Um, and she just had me do the 16th note runs through the piece, um, very slowly, note by note, t every rotation you know, as perfectly timed as possible. After six weeks of very slow, careful work, um, I was able to take on basically any piece I wanted. And now I'm, I'm able to play the Rachmaninoff third without too much trouble. <laughs> I never wanted to teach. I'm only interested in performing. 
could never conceive of myself as, as teaching except if I had to make a living. By the time my husband came home from World War II and he said to me, well, now you can quit your teaching and you can go back to your own performing. I said, I can't. He said, what do you mean? I said, I, I'm into something so spectacular and so important. It can't be just for myself. You have to realize that my generation was very socially oriented. We came out of a deep depression and there was a tremendous amount of liberalism and a feeling of, of helping mankind. And it would be inconceivable for me to have found something at that time and felt I had a right to keep it to myself. And Enid came to visit me in Beckett when I was in the country. And she said to me, I'm going to build you a school. I said, it's impossible. Schools are failing all over the place. How do you do that? She said, well, let's start with a seminar of some kind, a two-week session. And Amherst was such a gorgeous place, and such, so perfect for our needs. And so we came here, and here we are. I had graduated from Juilliard, and uh, I went to a competition, a fairly important international competition, and I won. And that was the first time that I really became aware that I was already a pianist. And I was here at Marlboro for the summer in 1976, and I met one of her students, and at that time, I was not happy with my playing, and I had some physical difficulties. Besides tension, which I wasn't aware of as being a problem at that point, I was having some pain in one of my fingers. And, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that doctors will tell you you have to be operated on, or you have arthritis, and you, sh you shouldn't play the piano anymore. It was not keeping me from playing, but it was, bo it was con I was concerned about it. I didn't know what it was. Uh, I didn't have the idea that it was from my playing exactly, but when I mentioned it to this other student, she said, oh, well, my teacher can clear that up in you know, two lessons, as she did. I just want to ask you, so you played it beautifully. When you first started, you missed some of the top notes. Is that only, does that happen occasionally? Uh-huh. All right. Now, interesting, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that there's necessarily anything technical there, but rather musical. If you treated it more like a theme and variations, I don't think you would have missed it. Now, if you will play that and think that what you want your audience to hear is yum, bum, bum, bum. Now, now play it and see if you have a problem. Ta, ta, ta. No, you see, the reason, let me show you why you have the problem. You're still playing this with the same approach in that you're chopping your off that note before you're on it. You can't miss a note if you're on it. What I want you to do is go on to the note and stay there for a second. You're still not making it important. By ch in other words, you're giving it the same timing of those fast notes. If it's important, you can't give it the same timing. Stay there. Ta, 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 ta. Ah, you had it. Ta, ta, ta. The whole, the whole 
interpretation changed. They're going to tiam, da 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 yam, ba da 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 yam. Again, it's going to the bells. It's going to the end. To the. to it once she knew she had a hold. Those are your... There can be no accuracy that way. That was beautiful. Pretend you're a bell. Right, let me see you do that again. Beautiful. Now stay there. Stay there. Tom. 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 Makes such a difference. Right, now you'll never miss it. Now, all right, and of course I feel that teaching is also knowing how to tell the pianist exactly how to do what you want him to do. I think the most frustrating thing in the world is having a young artist come in and to tell him what you want and his hands can't do it. It is the teacher's job to find a way to get the student to do it. We're talking about dedicated, earnest, and gifted people. There's no reason why any of them should not be able to do exactly what they want to do. What I was looking for was somebody who would help me do what I wanted to do. I play a lot of contemporary music and there are uh, sometimes extreme and strange things that one has to learn how to do. She has such a grasp on movement and piano playing that it was really ideal information for somebody in my situation. Uh, I do a lot of freelance work and that means learning a lot of pieces very quickly under a lot of pressure and you don't have time to make a lot of mistakes. It really helps if you know, okay, I have this problem, this is the kind of solution you look for. It saves a lot of time and when you have two weeks or one week or three weeks to learn a piece, you can't always sit around and just uh, keep, keep knocking at it until it, it gives. I come sometimes even to fairly strange problems. If I can reduce them to some basic movement ideas that I've learned from Dorothy, it makes my ability to learn them uh, just uh, a fraction of the amount of time it might have taken before when you're just kind of working from instinct. The principles of using the fingers are applicable to every instrument. The basic physiological laws are the same for your hand no matter what you do. It's the same in a sport. If you play tennis or golf, the same principles are there. The physiological principles and the physical laws are there, the mechanical laws are there. Not different. It'd be a question of intelligently applying it to the particular instrument. My senior year of college, I was doing a concert with a group, and in the middle of the concert, my third and fourth fingers totally locked, and I never did finish the concert. I could not move them up or down. There was just a total numbing as well as no way to move them unless I took my left hand and physically moved the fingers. It took several hours of massaging and then soaking it before the fingers would move on their own. But the pain lingered. It, it lingered all the way through my arm. She called me from Eastern Michigan. She's a teacher of the flute there. And Professor Joseph Gerd is my student there of piano, and she was also studying piano with him. And he called me and said, you must do something for this young girl. Her right hand is practically paralyzed. She's completely numb and she has severe pain, and she went to an orthopedist who wanted to break every bone in her hand. 
can be set. Since there was no guarantee if the bones would heal correctly and I'd be able to play at all after they took the cast off, I opted not to do that. And again, as with all the other doctors, he suggested that I find a new profession and start over. By this time, I had already finished my bachelor's degree. I was starting a master's degree, and that was the last thing I wanted to hear, was to start all over and find something else. Dorothy was a little reluctant. She said she had never worked with a flutist before and couldn't promise me anything. We worked jointly between the piano and the flute to see how the two instruments were similar to each other in their technique. Basically what the problem was on flute was that I was lifting my fingers off the keys, playing with a, a high finger action on the flute. She did the very thing that, they, that Schumann did. She pulled as she held down the other keys, she pulled each finger away when she let go. All she had to do was ride up with the key up to, when the, up to the surface of the key as it let go. There was no need to pull her fingers all the way up. She was pulling and stretching her fingers. Secondly, to do the sharps, you have to go sideways to the stop on the side there. So she was doing pulling her fingers and pulling sideways. She had no rotation. So I gave her a lesson on how to rotate over to the sharp and the flat. At the same, and not to allow the fingers to pull up, just to let the keys to come up. And there, she's very bright. She had it in two minutes. We spent an hour and a half just going over to make sure she understood, and that was the end of it. Yeah, I've been playing concerts, but for a while I stopped because I wanted really to take a good look at what I was doing. I never really was conscious about my movements, you know, my hand movements. Of course, uh, when you talk about technique, you talk about music. Every movement has all reason for it, you see. It's not just to be comfortable, but to, to do justice to the music, you know. When I was at Juilliard, that was the reason that when I heard about Mrs. Tau, when I saw, gee, technique, you know, that's, you know, that's just for the working man, working person, you know, that was something, you know, the elite did not think about technique. The two, technique and music, are so interrelated that I, there is no way to separate the two. First of all, if you cannot move properly, you cannot make music. If you cannot play evenly, if you play Mozart or Haydn and the runs are not even, there is no way to me, the music stops right there. But anything that you try, for example, when you talk about shaping, you see that when you shape a phrase in a certain way, the music come out in a certain way. Okay, your, your, your hand is rigid. You don't have a shape to help you. I want you to do this. Go down, go down, go down. Go down. Not that low, but you'll collapse your wrist, then you'll have another problem. You're going to play it in your back. You okay. can't collapse your wrist when I, as if.
I did the reading to see what research was in our field. And there were some important books. There's Ortman's book, The Physiological Mechanics of Piano Technique, where he did a lot of testing, mechanical testing in a dark room with lights on the hands of pianists, measuring motion, etc. Uh, he came up with some interesting basic concepts. I'll give you an example. He said that when you have movement in opposite direction, for example, uh, if you have alternating actions, if you're going up and down very quickly, you must get tired because the muscle that lifts your arm, which is an extensor, cannot relax quickly enough for the muscle that has to drop your arm to bring you down. They come in conflict and create tension. That's true. It's important to know that. But he came to the conclusion that therefore when you play octaves, there's no way that you can get rid of fatigue. You've got to slow down. Now what's incredible to me, the man goes to concerts, Horowitz doesn't slow down. Which of the great artists slow down? They take a Mephisto waltz and octaves and they go faster and faster and faster. So he has to hear that what he's saying is not so. If you get so tight, the pain would be so incredible. But nobody could do it. What he didn't realize is that if that principle is true, which it is, physiologically it's true, then artists must be playing octaves in a way totally unrelated to those movements. There are other movements. For example, one can get, one can get off the key by lifting the arm, but one can allow gravity to drop it down. You don't have to use your muscle. Your arm can fall. If it's falling without any muscular activity, then you no longer have an antagonistic movement in opposite directions. You have only an active movement in one direction. I want to ask them, what do you feel when you play it fast? What makes it hard? Are you tight? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I thought that's why I wanted to try it. Right, let me show you something, dear. I just want you to lean on me for one moment. Let all your weight go, sweetheart. Just don't do anything. Lean on me as if it was a dead arm, OK? Yeah, now I see. What you have to do is when you play your chords, you're, using, you're doing this. Do this. Do this. Now, let me move it. Mm -hmm. Just do nothing. Do you feel what that feels like? No, you're moving it. Don't do anything. Keep it dead. Let me move it. Let it just fall. You see what that feels like? There's no muscle working at all. What you have to do, I saw the tension. I realized that you were limited in speed. And there should be no limit to your speed in this thing. That if you allow it just to fall by itself, if you allow gravity, just let it fall by itself. Instead of doing this, you'll get tremendous speed. Do you want to try it for a moment so you can catch that? You might catch it right away. And let it go by itself. By itself. Just let it, let it bounce. Let it snap bounce by itself. I went in and I was in one of my black moods. And she said, what's bothering you this week? And I said, well, there are these big pieces I can't play. You know, I could never play it something like the Six Hungarian Rhapsody. So she said, nonsense. Here's the music. I'll teach you to play it right now. <laughs> so she said, play some octaves. So I played some octaves. And she said, no, you got it all wrong. It's, it's totally the wrong idea. You know? So what you have to understand is that it works this way. right? So try that. So I tried that. It doesn't work. So she says, well, turn your hand a little bit this way. Try this. You know? Keep doing this. All of a sudden, my hand overdrive. You know? like, I've been earthbound, and all of a sudden, blah, 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 blah. I, I picked up my hand, I looked at it, and said, this is my hand, you know? How did this happen? <laughs> it's not that, you know, instantaneously, all of a sudden I had perfect octaves, and I don't have perfect octaves now. I mean, I still have to concentrate on doing it right. But if I do it right, put it that way, if I do it right, it's effortless. In that sense, what she teaches is absolutely true, that it really is different and effortless if you do it right. The problem, of course, is to make, make it right every time. And the more you work with her, the easier it is to remember those sensations and let them become habits.
learn to dot the I of an idea. When, even when you begin, for Beethoven, first of all, the thing starts off very, in a very sinister way. Very kind of, it has to be much more rhythmic. It's a little too indecisive. I want you to start again a little more decisive than you did before. Yum, ba -bum. I'll tell you what bothers me about it. Your quick note is too flimsy for the character. In other words, I hear this. And I hear this. If I should hear. Every note. That's what gives it that very serious quality. Otherwise, it gets trivia. That sounds too dancey. That's not the character you really want. I know because from the way you built the piece, that's not what you're looking for. But that note is a little too fast. For the, for it's almost, you're playing it like a, a 30 second. Give the rhythm a little more precision. Now I want it done again, but softer. Every note. Another thing you did, you came here and you you jumped up in the air, and you're breaking the line. You're you're giving it like a hiccup. Yeah, you know, be don't don't make it so important. It's a leading tone. Keep it together. Yes. See what it did is take away the attention from the main line over here. Yeah, da da. You see? Now take the whole line. Yeah, yeah, da da. Keep the rhythm strict. Yum, da da, da da da, that da da, much better. Yum, don't jump off. Don't jump off. You did the same thing. That's right. It brings the attention to the right place. Listen to that. orchestrally when you think of Beethoven, think of some orchestral instrument that that is imitating and try to do that. Horns. 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 Now, bass. But listen to this. The last note should be, that should be, da 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 da. You see, I want you to, you see, you can't get it because your wrist is very low and your thumb is down on the side. Do it. Watch me. Da, da, da. Take your thumb. Da, da. Stand up. Stay with a high wrist. That's it. Get it. Ta. Da, da. Right. All right. Da, 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 da. Now get the bass. Ba, 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 bee, ba, ba, da, 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 da. You know what I want you to do? I want you to take off the pedal when you play this and give it its own character. Without pedal here. Off. But you were too slow. I want you to do it again. Jump and carry it on the on the on the arc of that. Wonderful. Thanks. Great.